My name is Kaylee Peel, and I'm Manager of Strategic Partnerships at the Linda Hall Library. Welcome to our Women in STEM series, in which the library hosts conversations with Kansas City leaders to discuss women in STEM by joining elements of the past, present, and future. Today, our guest is Libby Ullman. Good morning. Libby, welcome. Thank you for being here. I was so excited. So before we dive in, would you mind giving a brief overview of your experiences and your relationship to the STEM community here? Yeah, I would love to. So um, I'll start with the current and I'll go backwards. So I um, spent almost 30 years in supply chain in Kansas City. So the biggest bulk of that was 20 years at Hallmark Cards where I started out as an engineer uh, designing things and then worked my way up into managing technical people, um, so engineers, physics people, et cetera, mm -hmm. and then um, worked around manufacturing, procurement, and distribution. So large manufacturing, so a lot of people don't know that Hallmark makes um, the majority of their cards here in the area in Lawrence and Leavenworth, Kansas, and um, a big distribution center up in Liberty. So really, as I progressed through my career, I did less what I would what people would call engineering work and more, I would say, general management and strategic work, mm -hmm. but always, always went back to my engineering degree thinking about um, the way that I critically think, the way I solve problems, and using data to as a foundation. Mm -hmm. So that's really my work history um, in Kansas City. But I think it's something I want to share is really kind of where I started. So when I went to a small high school in the southwest corner of Missouri, Carthage, Missouri, and our school counselors really didn't have a lot of advice to give. So I did pretty well in math and science in school. This was, we didn't have AP classes then, so mm -hmm. I took as much as I could. Um, and I did well, Bs, not straight A's. Um, and so because my brother was an engineering student at Rolla, mm -hmm. I thought, well, I, maybe I want to be an engineer. And it was challenging, so I started off um, at Tulsa University majoring in petroleum engineering. And you might say, what? why petroleum engineering? Honestly, I did research and petroleum engineers were one of the highest paid types of engineers, and so that's why I picked it. Um, and I did horribly my first semester. And interestingly enough, it probably took me almost 15 years to even tell people what my GPA was my first semester. So I'll just tell you right here, I got a 2.0. Mm -hmm. So I got as many Bs as I did Ds, and the Ds were all in math and science, and the Bs were all in writing. And so, um, I talked to my mom and she's like, okay, maybe once more semester, let's just see how this goes. And I was like, you know what? Clearly I'm not designed for engineering. Um, clearly I'm not ready for this. So I'm just gonna go to Mizzou and I'm gonna major in journalism because I write really, really well. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Mizzou, I switched schools that semester, went to Mizzou and majored in journalism. And yes, did much, much better in terms of my GPA, but I wasn't very challenged. Um, and so I took a break at the summer and said, I really want to go back to Tulsa University and major in engineering again. I know I can do it. And my mom said, you don't know what you want to do. Why don't you stay close by? My mom lived in Kearney, Missouri at the time. And so I went to William Jewell because it was close. William Jewell did not have engineering at the time. The only thing they had was physics. And so I majored in physics with the knowledge of knowing I wanted to go do engineering as part of a dual degree program, which William Joel offered. So the whole point of that is, is you take people that want to be in engineering, but you first give them a foundation of liberal arts. So how to communicate, how to present, um, how to critically think, and then you stick them in an engineering program. So I did that program. I was the only female in the physics program at William Jewell. And honestly, it was tough for me. Like I had a class, one of the advanced classes, there were two of us in the class. One of them was the dean's son, and the professor would come in and put our test grades on the board, and there was only two of us. And he was getting like 90s, and I was still like in the 60, 70 range. Um, but nevertheless, I pursued, I went to WashU and then got my engineering degree. And my grades went up as I got into more classes that I was interesting, interested in. But I can't tell you the number of women, not, not men, the number of women that once they get their first D, because I talk to a lot of young students now, mm -hmm. they're like, I, I can't do this. I'm like, you can do this. Like, mm -hmm. it's not always going to be straight A's like it was in high school for most of these young women, um, but we need people to continue to pursue. And so I think by admitting I got a 2.0 my first semester, I think it kind of helps tell the story of sometimes you just have to have, have to have tenacity to get through it. And a lot of these engineering programs are designed to kind of weed out um, the people that aren't going to start off just doing, you know, a bang-up job. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a little bit about me. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that it's important for young people to understand that persistence is everything, but failure is okay. And linear, it's, it's very much a non-linear path that you can take, particularly in STEM. And that's what's, what we're trying to highlight more at the library, are these different career exploration tools, these different career pathways, and how things don't have to be um, the way in which we've done it in the past, particularly when it's mostly been a male-dominated field. Right. So it's really important. So thank you. I appreciate um, your vulnerability in that. Um, so the library, um, I know that you know a little bit about the library, um, but we have a specific acquisition focus um, on material created by and for women. So looking back on your journey, were there any historical female figures that really inspired you um, to take the jump and to build a career in STEM? You know, I mean, I'm not young, and so when I started, there wasn't a lot of talk about women in STEM. I mean, mm -hmm. it was mostly around men. Um, but I did meet Sally Ride, and I can't remember where I met her. I think it was at a Society of Women Engineers event or something like that. I met her, and what struck me about her was, frankly, she was normal. And by that, I mean she was a mom at the time I met her. She was married. She looked like a woman. I mean, she wasn't... Um, she didn't come across as just being this person that was only about science and math, but she also had a life. Um, and so she was very inspiring to me as I was thinking about, oh my gosh, I could do this too. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, there wasn't a lot of the books that are, are out now, both for children and adults, really profiling many women that were in the STEM fields. I mean, the movie Hidden Figures, right, that came mm -hmm. out fairly recently, really. Yes. They're they just weren't out there. So the people that I aspired to most were men that were in the field, which is, as I said earlier, my brother started out in engineering. Mm -hmm. And so that's what even gave me the idea about it because no one ever really talked to me about it. And then once I got out of college, I was pretty active in the Society of Women Engineers. And there were women that were 10, 15 years ahead of me in their careers. And they were really very inspiring about um, what I could do with my career, being able to be with other like-minded women, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, representation is key, and key. I think that that's something that we're really, I think we're doing a better job in the community now. The more um, women and minority groups who are in these roles, you get more young people who can see themselves in those roles then, right? Otherwise, how do you want to be, how do you want to en enter a STEM career when you don't know, you don't feel like you belong in those spaces? So right. I think that that's really important. And that kind of goes to my next question. So historically, we know that contributions to science, technology, and innovation from women were largely overlooked in the past or in a lot of cases taken mm -hmm. by their male counterparts. So what has been your personal experience as a woman in the Kansas City community in STEM, and how has that changed over the course of your career? You know, th that's a really interesting question. I think that a couple of things. When I was in school, so not necessarily in the Kansas City community, one of the things that would ha happen is the professor would give examples of things that I didn't know anything about. And the classic one, I was sitting in a mechanical engineering class and the professor was describing something and he said, you know, it's like a grommet. And I, in my mind, was like, what in the heck is a grommet? And, you know, I didn't have the internet to just go Google it mm -hmm. on my phone. Mm -hmm. But what he was using was experience that most of the male students in the room had had from changing oil in their car. Okay. And that, that was back in the time when you know, I grew up, my dad would change the oil in the car in the garage, right? You didn't just take it down the street. But my role in that was my dad would say, hey, can you hand me the pan? Like, bring me the pan, honey. Mm -hmm. And so he never really said, get under the car, let me show you how this works. It was more just, you, can you help me do this thing? And so I didn't have a lot of context for the things that professors were even talking about. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that professors, even still today, are conscientious, especially the male professors, are conscientious about what the students have seen before they walked in the door. Yeah. I think the other thing too is, is representation is really important because especially in something like engineering, it's very difficult for people to understand what an engineer even does. Mm -hmm. So you can explain what a doctor does, right? That's biology and biochemistry in that STEM field. But in engineering, it's just a little bit harder for people to imagine themselves being an engineer because they have no idea what the day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. you know, exists. But I know, Kaylee, one of the things you and I have talked about, and this is not necessarily just a STEM thing, but what I have experienced in the work world, in the business world, is um, many times having said something in the beginning of a meeting and halfway through or three quarters of the way through, the man, frankly, it's always the male in the room, mm -hmm. says exactly what I just said or a female just said. And I was like, 
well, I just said that. Like, how did you not hear what I just said? And I think that that has happened to me many times. It has happened to my female colleagues as well. I do think one of the things to combat that is to sometimes just wait to speak. And I think there's something to be said for the last person that speaks is the one that like gets all the honor and the glory of, oh my gosh, what a great idea. And so I do think those kinds of perceptions and realities are still happening today in the work world. You know, I totally agree with you. Um, thank you for sharing that because I know that those conversations are sometimes hard and I don't know that everyone is, I guess, willing to listen to the experiences of women. So having you here and talking about that, I think yeah. really opens doors for a lot of people who are watching. So thank you. Um, the library's collections, so we're we've talked about acquisitions. On the collection side, um, we allow our community to learn from and be inspired by women pioneers in STEM. Um, aside from the resources that we have at the library, how do you think we can do a better job, the STEM community overall? How can we do a better job at supporting women and marginalized groups to really help foster a more collaborative and diverse ecosystem here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough. And I think some ways it really hasn't even gotten better from the time that I was a young person in the community, mm -hmm. frankly. I do think that um, there are a lot of different groups that are trying a lot of different things. So for example, Girl Scouts does quite a bit in the STEM community, Society of Women Engineers, um, individual school systems. There are times though where I feel like the community could use someone like Linda Hall mm -hmm. to kind of pull everything together mm -hmm. so that there isn't a bunch of individuals doing things, but rather it's more cohesive and collaborative. And I think being able to show the community okay, here's an African-American female that's done STEM and she's doing great. Or here's someone that can really represent the students. So maybe someone that's young and energetic that can really kind of show them the way. I think the more that you can put people like that in front of groups of young women and men, I think that, that makes a big difference. I totally agree with you. And aside from collection and acquisition fo focuses that we have at the library, we're really also focusing on connecting science to a younger population. And we do that through career exploration tools and experiences, um, namely our How Do I Become series and our Kansas City Invention Convention. With the How Do I Become series, we're, we're constantly um, bringing in industry experts who are more near peers, who are diverse in age and race and gender, to really help um, kind of bridge those gaps with young people because, like we've all, we, what we've been saying, representation is super important. Um, so so having said that, what, would, what advice would you give to a young girl or young, young woman who are maybe seeking a career in STEM? What advice would you or what would you want them to know? You know, I think even with near peers and some of these other community efforts, one of the things that's difficult for young people to believe is I can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some extraordinary people in our community that are finding cures for cancer, that are, you know, starting businesses that grow to a gazillion dollars. I think it's really important to show there are normal people like me. I consider myself very normal. I have had a sh fair share of failures um, and a fair share of tenacity and a getting over. So I think the more that we can talk about that's a normal person, you can absolutely do that. You don't have to have a 4.0 mm -hmm. to pursue a degree in engineering. And so one of the things that when I'm speaking to young people I talk about is a couple of things. Number one, just because you made straight A's in high school in math and science doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do that in college. And, and yes, you do have to get good grades in order to get a job, but you don't have to have a 4.0. Mm -hmm. um, we need engineers and STEM people in the community like crazy. We have a shortage of that. So looking for perfection, I think, is something that we have to be very cautious of. I think the other thing, too, is just understanding that it does take a lot of confidence to be able to be the only young person in the room or to that wants to be an engineer for example mm -hmm. or to be able to tell your you know I had a situation at Thanksgiving one year I told my aunt who asked me well what do you want to be when you grow up because that is still the question that gets asked mm -hmm. and I said well I want to be an engineer and she's like well, women can't be engineers and my parents were at this Thanksgiving dinner and never said a word and I remember afterwards getting in the car almost in tears saying why did you guys leave me to you know, have to support myself in this whole thing. Like, why didn't you say, of course women can be, girls can be engineers. And my parents essentially said, you were doing fine on your own, you did not need our help. Mm -hmm. But I think being able to convey that there will be people out there that don't have the confidence that you could do what you can, but yet you can. 
And I think women supporting women is probably the third thing that I would say is we are not in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. We are very much should be cooperating and um, building each other up every chance we can because having confidence as a young person and even people my age is difficult for women. So the more that we can encourage each other, um, the better we'll be from that perspective. Yes, and I can say that you are a shining example of that, both being an advocate for women and young people and a mentor. We need more people like you in our community to Thanks. help steward this next generation. So thank you. That's, that's amazing. That's really inspiring. So aside from the historical context, um, you know, we, historically we have been the library supporting the advancements of women in STEM, but we're also celebrating current wins of women in our community, and we're helping to contribute to the future, to shape the future of work for women pioneers. Um, from your perspective, obviously change is slow, progress is slow, um, and kind of that's what we've discussed today, but what do you think the future of women in STEM looks like in the near future, both on a local and maybe a global scale? Well, we're not there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, frankly, I was speaking to someone who um, it works for a private equity firm, and she said out of all the CEOs, and there's many, 20 or so, she's the only female. Um, I was talking to someone else who is in venture capital, and being able to find other women that are leading venture capital, it's almost impossible. There's really not many across the country, and so I do think that we're not where we need to be. We're not even close, honestly. Mm -hmm. We're not even close to where we need to be. And so I think that the, you know, the constant talking about it, encouraging it, removing barriers. I mean, I think for some people, they've never seen an engineer, for example. They don't think they can achieve it. They don't have the opportunity with their coursework to pursue some of the things they need to pursue in order to get into mm -hmm. college that they need. So I think wherever can, we can remove barriers, um, and give just a little bit more of a nudge maybe to some of the women, the girls, and the minorities, I think that will be a helpful thing too. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Libby. I appreciate you being here, and um, we'll see you soon. I loved it. Thanks, Kaylee. Yeah.